welcome to Goodnight Flagstaff. I'm Erica Fraley, a local book lover. I've always loved to read, and this program is a great way for me to share that love with others. Thank you for tuning in to our community story time. You can find a new chapter from one of our favorite family-friendly books at 8 p.m. each weeknight on the Literacy Center's YouTube channel and on Crater Radio, a local online radio station. The previous chapter is replayed on Crater Radio each weeknight at about 7.30, just before the new chapter airs. You can also listen to all previous Goodnight Flagstaff recordings on YouTube. We are currently reading The Return of the King by J.R.R. Tolkien. If you'd like to check it out to read along with us at home, it is available at the library. Check one out today with your Coconino County library card. Please email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with your community through stories. All ages are welcome. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. Last time we read together, we finished The Two Towers and are excited to start the next and last chapters of the story of The Lord of the Rings. Synopsis. This is the third part of The Lord of the Rings. The first part, The Fellowship of the Ring, told how Gandalf the Grey discovered that the ring possessed by Frodo the Hobbit was in fact the One Ring, ruler of all the rings of power. It recounted the flight of Frodo and his companions from the quiet shire of their home, pursued by the terror of the Black Riders of Mordor, until at last, with the aid of Aragorn, the ranger of Eridor, they came through desperate perils to the house of Elrond and Rivendell. There was held the great council of Elrond, at which it was decided to attempt the destruction of the ring, and Frodo was appointed the ring-bearer. The companions of the ring were then chosen, who were to aid him in his quest, to come, if he could, to the mountain of fire in Mordor, the land of the enemy himself, where alone the ring could be unmade. In this fellowship were Aragorn, and Boromir, son of the Lord of Gondor, representing men, Legolas, son of the Alban king of Mirkwood, for the elves, Gimli, son of Gloin, for the Lonely Mountain, for the dwarves, Frodo, with his servant Samwise, and his two young kinsmen, Merodach and Peregrine, for the hobbits, and Gandalf the Grey. The companions journeyed in secret far from Rivendell, in the north, until baffled in their attempt to cross the high pass of Caradas in winter, they were led by Gandalf through the hidden gate and entered the vast mines of Moria, seeking a way beneath the mountains. There Gandalf, in battle with the dreadful spirit of the underworld, fell into a dark abyss. But Aragorn, now revealed as the hidden heir of the ancient kings of the west, led the company on from the east gate of Moria, through the land elvish land of Lorien, and down the great river Anduin, until they came to the falls of Roros. Already they had become aware that the journey was watched by the spies, and that the creature Gollum, who had once possessed the ring and still lusted for it, was following their trail. It now became necessary for them to decide whether they should turn east to Mordor or go on with Boromir to the aid of Minas Tirith, chief city of Gondor, in the coming war, or should divide. When it became clear that the ring-bearer was resolved to continue his hopeless journey to the land of the enemy, Boromir attempted to seize the ring by force. The first part ended with the fall of Boromir to the lure of the ring, with the escape and disappearance of Frodo and his servant Samwise, and the scattering of the remainder of the Fellowship by a sudden attack of orc soldiers, some in the service of the Dark Lord of Mordor, some of the traitor Saruman of Isengard. The quest of the ring bearer seemed already overtaken by disaster. The second part, books three and four, The Two Towers, recounted the deeds of all of the company after the breaking of the Fellowship of the Ring. Book three told of the repentance and death of Boromir, and of his funeral in a boat committed to the falls of Roros, of the capture of Merodach and Peregrine by orc soldiers, who bore them towards Isengard over the eastern plains of Rohan, and of their pursuit by Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. The riders of Rohan then appeared. A troop of horsemen, led by Eomer the marshal, surrounded the orcs on the borders of the forest of Fanghorn and destroyed them. But the hobbits escaped into the wood and there met Treebeard the Ent, secret master of Fanghorn. In this company, they witnessed the rousing of the wrath of the tree folk and their march on Isengard. In the meanwhile, Aragorn and his companions met Eomer returning from battle. He provided them with horses and they rode on to the forest. There, while searching in vain for the hobbits, they met Gandalf again, returned from death, now the white rider, yet veiled still in grey. With him they rode over Rohan to the halls of the King Theoden of the Mark, where Gandalf healed the aged king 
and rescued him from the spells of Wormtongue, his evil counselor, secret ally of Saruman. They rode with him, the king, and his host against the forces of Isengard, and took part in the desperate victory of the Hornburg. Gandalf then led them to Isengard, where they found the great fortress laid in ruins by the tree folk, and Saruman and Wormtongue besieged in the indomitable tower of the Orthmac. In the parley before the door, Saruman refused to repent, and Gandalf deposed him and broke his staff, leaving with him, leaving him to the vigilance of the Ents. From a high window, Wormtongue hurled a stone at Gandalf, but it missed him, and was picked up by Peregrine. This proved to be one of the three surviving Palantiri, the seeing stones of Numenor. Later at night, Peregrine succumbed to the lure of the stone. He stole it and looked in it, and so was revealed to Sauron. The book ended with the coming of a Nazgul over the plains of Rohan, a ring wraith mounted on a flying steed, presage of imminent war. Gandalf delivered the Palantir to Aragorn, and taking Peregrine, rode away to Minas Tirith. Book four turned to Frodo and Samwise, now lost in the bleak hills of Emin Mule. It told how they escaped from the hills, and were overtaken by Smeagol Gollum, and how Frodo tamed Gollum and almost overcame his malice, so that Gollum led them through the dead marshes and ruined lands of the Moranon, the Black Gate of the Land of Mordor in the north. There it was impossible to enter, and Frodo accepted Gollum's advice, to seek a secret entrance that he knew of, away in the mountains of shadow, the western walls of Mordor. As they journeyed thither, they were taken by a scouting force of men of Gondor, led by Faramir, brother of Boromir. Faramir discovered the nature of their quest, but resisted the temptation to which Boromir had succumbed, and sent them forward on the last stage of their journey to Sirith Ungol, the Spider's Pass though he warned them that it was a place of mortal peril, of which Gollum had told them less than he knew. Even as they reached the crossroads and took the path to the ghastly city of Minas Morgul, a great darkness issued from Mordor, covering all the lands. Then Sauron sent forth his first army, led by the Black King of the Ring Wraiths. The War of the Ring had begun. Gollum guided the hobbits to a secret way that avoided Minas Morgul, and in the darkness they came at last to Sirith Ungol. There Gollum fell back into evil, and attempted to betray them to the monstrous guardian of the pass, Shelob. He was frustrated by the heroism of Samwise, who beat off his attack and wounded Shelob. The second part ends with the choices of Samwise. Frodo, stung by Shelob, lies dead, as it seems. The quest must end in disaster, or Samwise must abandon his master. At length, he takes the ring and attempts to carry on the hopeless quest alone. But just as he is about to cross into the land of Mordor, orcs come up from Minas Morgul and down from the tower of Sirith Ungol that guards the crown of the pass. Hidden by the ring, Samwise learns from the bickering of the orcs that Frodo is not dead, but drugged. Too late, he pursues them, but the orcs carry off the body of Frodo down a tunnel leading to the rear gate of their tower. Samwise falls in a swoon before before it as it closes with a clang. This, the third and last part, will tell of the opposing strategies of Gandalf and Sauron until the final catastrophe and the end of the great darkness. We return first to the fortunes of the battle in the west. The return of the king being the third part of the Lord of the Rings. Book five, chapter one, Minius Tirith. Pippin looked out from the shelter of Gandalf's cloak he wondered if he was still awake or still sleeping, still in the swift moving dream in which he had been wrapped for so long since the great ride began. The dark world was rushing by and the wind sang loudly in his ears. He could see nothing but the wheeling stars and away to his right vast shadows against the sky where the mountains of the south marched past. Sleepily, he tried to reckon the times and stages of their journey, but his memory was drowsy and uncertain. There had been the first ride at terrible speed without a halt, and then in the dawn he had seen a pale gleam of gold, and they had come to the silent town and the great empty house on the hill. And hardly had they reached its shelter when the winged shadow had passed over once again, and men wilted with fear. But Gandalf had spoken soft words to him, and he had slept in a corner, tired but uneasy, dimly aware of comings and goings of men talking and Gandalf giving orders and then again riding, riding into the night. This was the second, no, third night since he had looked in the stone, 
and with that hideous memory he woke fully and shivered, and the noise of the wind became filled with menacing voices. A light kindled in the sky, a blaze of yellow fire behind dark barriers. Pippin cowered back, afraid for a moment, wandering into what dreadful country Gandalf was burying him. He rubbed his eyes, and then saw that it was the moon rising above the eastern shadows, now almost at full. So the night was not yet old, and for hours the dark journey would go on. He stirred and spoke. "'Where are we, Gandalf?' he asked. "'In the realm of Gondor,' the wizard answered. "'The land of Anorion is still passing by.' There was a silence again for a while. Then, "'What is that?' cried Pippin suddenly, clutching Gandalf's cloak. "'Look! Fire! Red fire! Are there dragons in this land? Look! There is another!' For answer, Gandalf cried aloud to his horse, "'On, Shadowfax! We must hasten! Time is short. See, the beacons of Gondor are alight, calling for aid. War is kindled. See, there is fire on Amundin, and flame on Elenac. And there they go speeding west. Nardal, Aralos, Minrimmon, Calahad, and the Halfirian on the borders of Rohan. But Shadowfax paused in a stride, slowing to a walk, and then he lifted up his head and neighed. And out of the darkness, the answering neigh of other horses came, and presently the thudding of hoofs was heard, and three riders swept up and plassed, like flying ghosts in the moon, and vanished into the west. Then Shadowfax gathered himself together and sprang away, and the night flowed over him like a roaring wind. Pippin became drowsy again, and paid little attention to Gandalf, telling him of the customs of Gondor, and how the lord of the city and had beacons built on the tops of outlying hills along both borders of the great range, and maintained posts at these points where fresh horses were always in readiness to bear his errand riders to Rohan in the north or to Belafellas in the south. It is long since the beacons of the north were lit, he said, and in the ancient days of Gondor they were not needed, for they had the seven stones. Pippin stirred uneasily. Sleep again, and do not be afraid, said Gandalf, for you are not going like Frodo to Mordor, but to Minas Tirith, and there you will be as safe as you can be anywhere in these days. If Gondor falls, or the ring is taken, then the Shire will be no refuge. You do not come for me, said Pippin, but none the less sleep crept over him. The last thing he remembered before he fell into deep dream was a glimpse of high light peaks, glimmering like floating isles above the clouds as they caught the light of the westering moon. He wondered where Frodo was, and if he was already in Mordor, or if he was dead. And he did not know that Frodo from far away looked on that same moon as it set beyond Gondor ere the coming of the day. Pippin woke to the sound of voices. Another day of hiding and a night of journey had fleeted by. It was twilight. The cold dawn was at hand again, and chill gray mists were about them. Shadowfax stood steaming with sweat, but he held his neck proudly and showed no sign of weariness. Many tall men, heavily cloaked, stood beside him, and beside them in the mist loomed a wall of stone. Partly ruinous, it seemed, but already before the night was past, the sound of hurried labor could be heard. Beat of hammers, clink of trowels, and the creak of wheels. Torches and flares glowed dully here and there in the fog. Gandalf was speaking to the men that barred his way, and as he listened, Pippin became aware that he himself was being discussed. Yea, truly, we know you, Mithrandir said the leader of the men, and you know the passwords of the seven gates and are free to go forward. But we do not know your companion. What is he? A dwarf out of the mountains in the north? We wish for no strangers in the land at this time, unless they be mighty men of arms, in whose faith and help we can trust. I will vouch for him before the seat of Denethor, said Gandalf. And as for valor, that cannot be computed by stature. He has passed through more battles and perils than you have in gold though you be twice his height, and he comes from the storming of Isengard, of which we bear tidings, and great weariness is on him, or I would wake him. His name is Peregrine, a very valiant man. Man? said Ingold dubiously, and the others laughed. Man? cried Pippin, now thoroughly roused. Man? Indeed not. I am a hobbit, and no more valiant than I am a man. Say perhaps now and again by necessity. Do not let Gandalf deceive you. Many a doer of great deeds might say no more, said Ingold. But what is a hobbit? A halfling, answered Gandalf. Nay, not the one that was spoken of, he added, seeing the wonder in the men's faces. Not he, yet one of his kindred. Yes, 
and one who journeyed with him, said Pippin. And Boromir of your city was with us, and he saved me in the snows of the north, and at last he was slain, defending me from many foes. Peace, said Gandalf. The news of that grief should have first been told to the father. It has been guessed already, said Ingold, for there have been strange portents here of late. But pass on now quickly, for the lord of Minas Tirith will be eager to see any that bear the latest tidings of his son, be he man or hobbit, said Pippin. Little service can I offer to your lord, but what I can, I would do, remembering Boromir the Brave. Fare you well, said Ingold, and the men made way for Shadowfax, and he passed through a narrow gate in the wall. May you bring good counsel to Denethor in his need, and to us all, Mithrandir, Ingold cried. But you come with tidings of grief and danger, as is your wont, they say. Because I seldom come but when my help is needed, answered Gandalf. And as for counsel, to you I would say that you are over late in repairing the wall of Pelennor. Courage will be your best defense against the storm that is at hand. That in such hope as I bring. For not all the tidings that I bring are evil. Believe your trowels and sharpen your swords. The work will be finished ere evening, said Ingold. This is the last portion of the wall to be put in defense. The least open to attack, for it looks towards our friends of Rohan. Do you know aught of them? Will they answer the summons, think you? Yes, they will come. But they have fought many battles at your back. This road and no road looks towards safety any longer. Be vigilant. But for Gandalf Stormcrow, you would have seen a host of foes coming out of Anorian and no riders of Rohan. And you may yet. Fare you well and sleep not. Gandalf passed now into the wide land behind the Ramas Ekor. So the men of Gondor called the Outwall that they had built with great labor, after Athelion fell under the shadow of their enemy. For ten leagues or more it ran from the mountain's feet, and so back again, enclosing in its fence the fields of the Pelennor, fair and fertile townlands on the long slopes and terraces falling to the deep levels of the Anduin. At its furthest point from the great gate of the city, northeastward, the wall was four leagues distance, and there were there a frowning bank it overlooked the long flats beside the river, and men had made it high and strong, for at that point, upon a walled causeway, the road came in from the fords and bridges of Auxilioth, and passed through a guarded gate between battlement towers. At its nearest point, the wall was little more than one league from the city, and that was southeastward. There Anduin, going in a wide knee about the hills of Emmon Arnon and South Anthelion, bent sharply west, and the outwall rose upon its very brink, and beneath it lay the quays and landings of the Harland for craft that came upstream from the, south, from the southern fiefs. The townlands were rich, with wide tilth and many orchards, and homesteads there were in great oasts and garner, fold and byre and many rills rippling through the green from the highlands down to Anduin. Yet the herdsmen and husbandmen that dwelt there were not many, and the most part of the people of Gondor lived in the seven circles of the city, or in the high vales of the mountain borders, in Losarnak, or further south in fair Lebanon with its five swift streams. There dwelt a hardy folk between the mountains and the sea. They were reckoned men of Gondor, yet their blood was mingled, and there were short and swarthy folk among them, whose sires came more from the forgotten men who housed in the shadow of the hills in the dark years ere the coming of the kings. But beyond, in the great fife of Balfalas, dwelt Prince Imrahil in his castle of Dol Amrath by the sea, and he was of high blood, and his folk also, tall men and proud with sea-gray eyes. Now after Gandalf had ridden for some time, the light of day grew in the sky, and Pippin roused himself and looked up. To his left lay a sea of mist, rising to a bleak shadow in the east. But to his right great mountains reared their heads, ranging from the west to a steep and sudden end, as if in the making of the land of the river had burst through a great barrier, carving out a mighty valley to be a land of battle and debate in times to come. And there were the white mountains of Arid Nimras came to their end, he saw, as Gandalf had promised, the dark mass of Mount Mildulin, the deep purple shadows of its high glens, and its tall face whitening in the rising day. And upon its outthrust knee was the guarded city, with its seven walls of stone, so strong and old, 
that it seemed to have been not been builded, but carven by giants out of the bones of the earth. Even as Pippin gazed in wonder, the walls passed from looming gray to white, blushing faintly in the dawn, and suddenly the sun climbed over the eastern shadow and sent forth a shaft that smote the face of the city. Then Pippin cried aloud, for the, po for the tower of Ethelion, standing high within the topmost wall, shone out against the sky, glimmering like a spike of pearl and silver, tall and fair and shapely, and its pinnacle glittered as if it were wrought of crystals and white banners broke and fluttered from the battlements in the morning breeze, and high and far he heard a clear ringing as of silver trumpets. So Gandalf and Peregrine rode to the great gate of the men of Gondor at the rising of the sun, and its iron doors rolled back before them. Mithrinder, Mithrinder, men cried. Now we know that the storm is indeed nigh. It is upon you, said Gandalf. I have ridden on its wings. Let me pass, I must come to your lord Denethor, while his stewardship lasts. Whatever betide, you have come to the end of Gondor that you have known. Let me pass. Then, Mel then men fell back before the command of his voice and questioned him no further, though they gazed in wonder at the hobbit that sat before him and at the horse that bore him. For the people of the city used horses very little, and they were seldom seen in their streets, save only ridden by the errand, errand riders of their lord. And they said, surely that is one of the great steeds of the king of Rohan. Maybe the Rohirrim will come soon to strengthen us. But Shadowfax walked proudly up the long, winding road. For the fashion of Minius Tirith was such that it was built on seven levels, each delved into the hill, and about each was set a wall, and in each wall was a gate. But the gates were not set in a line. The great gate of the city wall was at the east point of the circuit, but the next faced south, and the third half north, and so on and fro upwards, so that the paved way that climbed towards the citadel turned first this way, and then that, across the face of the hill. And each time that it passed the line of the great gate, it went through an arched tunnel, piercing a vast pier of rock, whose huge outthrust bulk divided in two all of the circles of the city save the first. For partly in primeval shaping of the hill, partly by the mighty craft and labor of old, there stood, up from the rear of the wide court behind the gate, a towering bastion of stone, its edge sharp as a ship keel facing east. Up it rose, even to the level of the topmost circle, and there was crowned by a battlement, so that those in the citadel might, like mariners on a mountainous ship, look from its peak sheer down upon the gate seven hundred feet below. The entrance to the citadel also looked eastward, but was delved in the heart of the rock. Thence a long, lamplit slope ran up the seventh gate. Thus men reached at last the high court, and the place of the fountain before the feet of the white tower, tall and shapely, fifty fathoms from its base to the pinnacle, where the banner of the stewards floated a thousand feet above the plain. A strong citadel it was indeed, and not to be taken by a host of enemies, if there was a, any within that could hold weapons, unless some foe could come behind and scale the lower skirts of the Mindelin, and so come up the narrow shoulder that joined the hill of guard to the mountain pass. But that shoulder, which rose to the height of the fifth wall, was hedged with great ramparts right up to the precipice that overhung its western end, and in that space stood the houses and domed tombs of bygone kings and lords, forever silent between the mountain and the tower. Pippin gazed in growing wonder at the great stone city, vaster and more splendid than anything he had dreamed of, greater and stronger than Isengard, and far more beautiful. Yet it was in truth falling year by year into decay, and already it lacked half the men that could have dwelt at ease there. In every street they passed, some great house or court, over whose doors and arched gates were carved many fair letters of strange and ancient shapes. Names Pippin guessed of great men and kindreds that had once dwelt there. And yet now were silent, and no footsteps ran on their wide pavements, nor voice was heard in their halls, nor any face looked out from door or empty window. At last they came out of shadow to the seventh gate, and the warm sun that, sh that shone down beyond the river, as Frodo walked in the glades of the Thillion, glowed here on the smooth walls and rooted pillars. And the great arch with keystone carven, the likeness of a crowned and kingly head. 
Gandalf dismounted, for no horse was allowed in the citadel, and Shadowfax suffered himself to be led away at the soft word of his master. The guards of the gate were robed in black, and their helms were of strange shape, high-crowned, with long cheek guards close-fitting to the face, and above the cheek guards were set the wide wings of seabirds. But the helms gleamed with a flare of silver, for they were indeed wrought of mithril, heirlooms from the glory of old days. Upon the black surcoats were embroidered in white, a tree blossoming like snow beneath a silver crown and many pointed stars. This was the livery of the heirs of Elendil, and none wore it now in all Gondor, save the guards of the citadel, before the court of the fountain, where the white tree had once grown. Already it seemed that the word of their coming had gone before them, and at once they were admitted, silently and without question. Quickly Gandalf strode across the white-paved court. A sweet fountain played there, in the morning sun, and a sward of bright green lay about it. But in the midst, drooping over the pool, stood a dead tree, and the falling drops dripped sadly from its barren and broken branches back into the clear water. Pippin glanced at it as he hurried after Gandalf. It looked mournful, he thought, and he wondered why the dead tree was left in this place where everything else was well tended. Seven stars and seven stones and one white tree. The words that Gandalf had murmured came back into his mind, and then he found himself at the doors of the great hall beneath the gleaming tower, and behind the wizard he passed the tall, silent door wardens and entered the cool, echoing shadows of the House of Stone. They walked down a paved passage, long and empty, and as they went, Gandalf spoke softly to Pippin. Be careful of your words, Master Peregrine. This is no time for hobbit pertness. Theoden is a kindly old man. Denethor is of another sort, proud and subtle, a man of far greater lineage and power, though he is not called a king. But he will speak to you but he will speak most to you, and question you much, since you can tell him of his son Boromir. He loved him greatly, too much perhaps, and the more so because they were unlike. But under cover of this love, he will think it easier to learn what he wishes from you rather than from me. Do not tell him more than you need, and leave quiet the matter of Frodo's errand. I will deal with that in due time, and say nothing about Aragorn either, unless you must. Why not? What is wrong with Strider? Pippin whispered. He meant to come here, didn't he? And he'll be arriving soon himself, anyway. Maybe, maybe, said Gandalf. Though if he comes, it is likely to be in some way that no one expects, not even Denethor. It will be better so. At least he should come unheralded by us. Gandalf halted before a tall door of polished metal. See, Master Pippin, there is no time to instruct you now in the history of Gondor, though it might have been better if you had learned something of it when you were still in birds nesting and playing truant in the woods of the Shire. Do as I bid. It is scarcely wise when bringing the news of the death of his heir to a mighty lord to speak over much of the coming of one who will, if he comes, claim the kingship. Is that enough? Kingship, said Pippin, amazed. Yes, said Gandalf. If you have walked all these days with closed ears and mind asleep, wake up now. He knocked on the door. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in next time for more of Chapter 1 in Book 5 of The Return of the King. Good night, Flagstaff.